And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple. Coming to coming fresh off the heels of Nations and Cannons, and now the and now its first proper expansion with Flintlocks and Fulminates. The one and only Pat Luke Mooney. How are we doing today, man? I'm uh, doing pretty good. Uh, thank you so much for having us uh, back on your show. Mm -hmm. Thank you for thank you for coming back on. Uh, so. Obviously, go obviously going with the humble beginnings would be redundant. We already did that last time I ha I had you on, <laughs> um, almost one almost one year to the day. <laughs> Is it now? Oh, well, we 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 certainly timed that one hundred percent on purpose. <laughs> totally. But yeah, I I double check I double checked I had you on on August twenty August twenty fourth of last year. But now, F Flintlocks and Fulminates is, like I said, is your first pro is your first proper expansion for Nations and Cannons, and since since the, and given what's involved, was in some games, one of the first expansions consists of things that they wanted to put into the core book, but they didn't have enough room. Was this kind of one of those situations, or was this something you wanted? To, were these things that you wanted to um, separate off into into its own book from the get go? You know, it's uh, I'll, I'll dodge and I'll call it a little bit of a chicken and the egg. Um, so this uh, we have been ever since we published our, our first uh, core rules publication of Nations of Cannons, um, which is you know uh, general you know uh, quick you know two sentence elevator pitch, right? Um, uh, 18th century D and D. We give you all the tools you need to strip out supernatural elements from your game um, and replace uh, all the stuff that's lost with um, black powder, firearms, artillery, grenades, and uh, all the stuff you need to play in a historic 18th century context. Um, so uh, our first product was oriented around the American Revolutionary War. Uh, that's sort of the, the nucleus of our our, our brand, uh, you know, at the at the time. Um, but we always, always, always get people coming up to us, you know, when we were exhibiting for the first time at Gen Con last year, or you know, again um, in any of the events we've done since. Um, hey, I, I really like this these these rules. I really like this concept. Um, where else can I use it in history, right? Um, and so, Flintlocks and Fulminates is kind of coming out of that, thinking about. Um, you know, on the one side, where I can push history to its kind of limit, like, what is the best time frame that I can kind of situate the mechanics and the different items and uh, feats and subclasses and all these things that we have that are supporting this black powder system? Um, you know, uh, where can I kind of fix that in time um, to allow for some natural expansions of, like, you know, introducing cool new capabilities and, and new new types of uh, uh, firearm properties and stuff like that. Um, but also to like let the player and let the GM you know, uh, have a, a pretty broad range, tell a, a variety of stories. And so what we wound up settling with there um, was this time frame, this, this sort of 200 year era from around 1650 all the way through to 1850. So that's like the golden age of piracy uh, straight up to about the eve of the Civil War, right? Um, and you know, in that time period, and you know, I'm 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 sure I'm going to be put on blast by saying this by military historians, right? But broadly, broadly speaking, um, the dynamics of linear warfare did not change all that much, right? The the sort of the battle doctrine, right? The strategies that were employed um, were, you know, there was some evolution over time. But you can you can kind of point as you know far back as sort of the late English Civil War and as far forward as 
you know, uh, John Brown's raid on Harper's Ferry, right? Um, and a lot, of, a lot of similar equipment um, and uh, similar like fighting styles were really being utilized. Um, and so that gives us like a really fun uh, sort of range of eras that we can tell stories in, um, but also to create rules and talk about the development of firearms and you know how that gives players lots of fun toys to play with and also uh, some perhaps less predictable toys that can lead to uh explosive results shall we say mm -hmm. and when i was going through when i was going through um fnf um one thing that i know one thing that i noticed was the symbol was the symbol use when it came to when it came to things like weapon grip, um, and I I had just to make sure I wasn't going crazy, I double checked to see if that was in Nations and Cannons. Mm -hmm. It it wasn't. It's some it's something that was added into this. What gave you guys the idea to do that to do that? Because it's a little thing that goes a long way. Oh, interesting. Okay, yeah, that is something that. Um... Uh, my my collaborator fought me tooth and nail against uh, instituting, and I, I had a very strong opinion of it. Um, the idea of what we're calling grip is it consolidates the systems in uh, base, baseline uh, 5e weapon properties of um, a two-handed weapon, um, a versatile weapon, and a one-handed weapon, which, technically speaking, a one-handed weapon is not instantiated anywhere in the rules. It's just a weapon is two-handed, which makes it not one-handed. Um, so that's that was sort of one of the reasons why we wanted to do this, was to, you know, to set up uh, a mechanical condition of a weapon being one-handed uh, so that we can refer back to it. Mm -hmm. um, so these, these icons that we're using, um, we wanted to make sure for consistency's sake um, that we are... Uh, you know, reference them them all the way throughout the text, um, so that uh, anytime they come up, um, it it's sort of a, a reminder to the player of uh, this is this the importance of this system. Um, and the reason why is because um, Nations and Cannons is uh, you know a system built around black powder firearms. Mm -hmm. Most black powder firearms being single shot muzzle loaders. Um, so you know a brown best musket, which is kind of our our, our baseline weapon deals a tremendous amount of damage it deals 2d8 damage at uh range i think it's got a 50 foot range um which can be modified by a variety of different uh factors um uh you know that's more than the great sword um that's very intentional but of course requires reloading um after it's utilized right after you fired it then you have to spend uh, an action or an attack to to reload it and um you know the sort of secret sauce of Nations and Cannons is um, that we've we haven't just taken 5e and tossed a bunch of guns on top. We've built this uh, kind of cohesive rule set around firearms, integrating them into different class features and and itemization. And the most important one of those, um, which you know exists in the core Nations and Cannons rules, but we're kind of putting our thumb on the scale a little bit here. Um, it's called War Gear, mm -hmm. and the concept of War Gear is that they um, are things that you can equip to kind of customize your character's role in the party, your loadout, in a way. Um, and, and they're supposed to be strategic decisions that give minor benefits, but you know really help you fulfill a different place in the party. And, and they're, they're choices that you're making, right? So if you're a rifleman, you might wear uh, what's called a bullet starter in, a, a, you know, in, in your chest slot. That's in a kind of a sling you know, around your, your neck. Um, and a bullet starter is is uh, kind of a fitted tube that allows you to load a rifle more effectively. You put your your cartridge, um, uh, you empty your cartridge, uh, you put the ball the ball and powder in there, and, and it helps you kind of ram it down and seat the ball into the base of of a you know a Pennsylvania rifle uh, or Kentucky rifle, depending on where you're from. Um, and you know this is this is a real world uh, item. You know, all of these things came out of um, working with uh, folks in the living history space. You know, reenactors, um, people who are are involved in you know the material culture and recreations of material culture of the 18th century. And so, a bullet starter allows you to use a rifle more effectively. The mechanical benefit is that reduces the misfire, the chance of your rifle you know going awry when you fire it, but 
another item that you could equip in that chest slot is a, a pistol brace, right? So think your kind of stereotypical um, uh, Blackbeard, mm-hmm. right? Uh, with with three pistols, you know, strapped across his chest, so he's just drawing and firing, dropping them, right? And he just never runs out because uh, his his build effectively is going into battle with as many loaded flintlock pistols as he can, you know, stuff onto his person. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, uh, the reason why all this is important to kind of finally get back to your question, right, is that um, all, all of, a lot of the war gear key off of uh, the, the grip, what we're, you know, we're, we're styling as the grip of the weapon, right? So if it's a two-handed weapon, like a, a musket or a rifle, we can use a baldric to, uh, in, in your back slot or your shoulder slot um, to kind of sling that over your shoulder and, and store it. And that means that you have you know, an additional equipped weapon. You can go into the field with, you know, a musket held in your hands and a rifle over your shoulder, so you can get two shots off before you have to re- uh, reload. Mm-hmm. Um, or that, you know, that uh, pistol brace I was just talking about, that allows you to equip three one-handed pistols. So we definitely want to push pistols as a kind of a dual-wield play style, um, something that, that is very powerful, you know, in the wrong hands uh, with mm-hmm. rogues. Um, and... Um, uh, by using iconography and uh, some of the ways that we're kind of um, referencing these things in the rules, especially in, in this uh, printing, we're able to kind of draw more attention to that um, and sort of the primacy of that system. Because it's it's a little, I don't want to say it's unintuitive, but it's a, it's a shift mm-hmm. from the way that baseline 5e combat plays out. Yeah. And so we wanted to make sure that we're constantly giving enough uh, ref- referential material and, and sort of clues so that players while reading this will kind of understand, oh, okay, that's why it's designed this way. And they can kind of figure it out from there. Yeah. And from there is the, there is definitely a shift, but when you're when you're going from when you're going from high fantasy to to as grounded as you can be, um, shifts are inevitable. But with I'm not sure if I asked this last time, but given the fact that that certain war gear in the in the core book and, and the like um, would mention attunement, um, how do you rationalize that in this? How do you rationalize attunement in this kind of <laughs> setting? That that honestly, that's something that I um, there are a few mechanical holdovers from you know supernatural 5e mm-hmm. that are just important gameplay mechanics and attunement is one of those where like it's it's a it's a limitation right certain powerful items allow you to be you need to be attuned in order to receive their benefit and so with a weapon that kind of makes sense like this gear is a very particular firearm this is a prototype or uh it's it's something that is uh you know very effective but uh requires constant like cleaning and maintenance um, and so there's sort of that narrative that we're trying to push a little bit of, you know, um, this is a, a specialty item. You can't you can't go into battle with three of these things, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and and you know uh, that's also a balancing factor where um, you know if that that weapon is particularly powerful, uh, we don't want players to have multiples or duplicates of it. Um, and that's, that's one way that we can kind of allow you to have an extra strong firearm, but then you know uh, a control how how much you know it, it's kind of in circulation mm. um and i think with war gear it's kind of a, in a similar way there are some of them that are a powdered wig um <laughs> this is one of my favorites the powdered wig allows you to cast um code duello uh this is a new gambit that we've created um gambits being uh, sort of uh non-magical mundane spells um so you know uh fix of uh daring do or gumption you know laying a trap for your enemies uh giving inspirational speech or in this case challenging them to a duel um and uh so um over the course of the last year we have uh, we've done a, a refresh of our core rules with a new printing in, in hardcover now um and a big part of that We've done some balance changes and some sort of minor quality of life updates. Uh, added a little bit more narrative content, um, a map in the back of the book, which people were, you know, a lot of people were asking for, you know, uh, continental uh, North America. Um, but the uh, the ones that that I'm particularly proud of are we've added some new 
gambits, and we've uh, we've basically made ourselves um, uh, completely self-sufficient, where we're not referencing any material that's not in the SRD. Um, and so, the where Nations and Cannons got its start uh, was kind of uh, oh, yeah, flint like firearms work really well with the kind of the action economy of five E. Oh, that's neat. And then this sort of second and parallel thought, which is uh, Amal- Alexander Hamilton absolutely knew the cantrip vicious mockery right <laughs> um and, and you know compelled duel is one of those like oh it's such an iconic spell and it has this like this is such a strong flavor to it but unfortunately um it's one of the new spells that was added in 5e it's not part of the, a lot of the legacy content um that makes up the srd or the system reference document so you know effectively um it is copyrighted by wizards of the coast um and so third-party products kind of shouldn't be referencing it or, or utilizing it in, in a big way. Um, certainly can't reprint it. And so we made a new gambit called um, Code Duello. Uh, and we've included a lot of information there with that one about um, historical practices on challenging someone to a duel, uh, what was considered fair and honorable, and that what also might be in certain contexts, um, you know, uh, dishonorable, right? Or, you know, uh, dueling was, was famously... Um, uh, legal in certain states, but not in others. Uh, everything's legal in New Jersey, of course. Um, <laughs> right. Uh, so you know, uh, the the powdered wig war gear allows you to cast Code Duello once per day, mm-hmm. um, and and it requires attunement. And so you know that attunement is like, oh well, I'm 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 brushing my wig. I'm uh, I'm reapplying powder to kind of like maintain it and and make sure that it has that it still has that allure. It gives me that uh, you know ability to uh, to come across as a high society individual uh, things like that. Mm-hmm. Now, one of the one of the things that I could that I couldn't that I couldn't help but notice that was added, which was. Or not not at not added, but um, was was certainly emphasized is mi- is misfiring because I'm guessing that that was ter- that you put that you put that kind of thing in to reflect that while black powder could certainly be powerful, um, you are gambling. Mm-hmm. And um, and that's one of those things where so so. If you look at the development of uh, sort of gunslinging in D anD D, right? Um, and so our rules, uh, you know, we wanted them to be compatible with the gunslinger variant um, that Matt Mercer put together uh, for Critical Role, which was itself borrowing elements from uh, originally uh, Pathfinder First Edition's gunslinger. Mm-hmm. Um, it's and that, so, that it's features a whole lot more than borrowing. It's yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's it's a deep rabbit hole, right? Uh-huh. Um, but uh, you know, misfire is a sort of a critical balancing element um, of of originally of the, of the the Pathfinder gunslinger, right? Um, and I think it's it's a slightly awkward fit um, in the 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 fighter subclass gunslinger um, that Critical Role did. Um, I think it, it's it's usable, but um, it does get a lot of flack on the internet. Um, if if I'm uh, being if I'm being honest. Um, I, I was, I, I was never in favor of, of take, of taking a concept like gunslinger and trying to force feed that into, um, fighter. I think, I think the concept of a gunslinger should be, should be, should be its own, should be its own class. Especially well, let me uh, on on the subject. Let me give a, a shout out to uh, our friends over at Mage Hand Press. Um, so in oh yeah, um, those guys, those guys are great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, they've been super. You know, we, we've we've made uh, good good friends with them over the course of our last couple of trips out to Indianapolis for Gen Con. Mm-hmm. Um, and in in their book, uh, Vault the Spire of Secrets, they have a dedicated gunslinger class with you know a whole. I think it's like eight subclasses right ranging from like sharpshooter to gun tank right and it's 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 great it's a lot of fun it it takes that and it you know sur- I, I was almost surprised reading it that it was able to work into it um you know a, a creating a new class in and of itself is hard 
right? And so having enough to fit into the chassis of that, that it doesn't feel like it's just uh, through the kitchen sink at it, right? To fill up like empty levels. But they really, they've got some cool ideas in there and, and they have some mechanics. They have a, a, a die that you roll specifically um, to trigger certain effects. Um, and it, it feeds into that kind of narrative that like uh, high noon, like, you know, uh, quick draw uh, narrative really well. I think it works, works quite nicely. Yeah. Especially, especially since somebody who's picking Gunslinger, um, they want to be the man with no name. Yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> there's, there's no, there's no get, there's no getting around that fact. And anyone claiming otherwise, well, it is a free country, and you are free to be wrong. <laughs> and now, since we go, we we go all the way up to 1850, you can in fact be the man with no name in your nation's end cannons. <laughs> um, uh, but to, so so to to misfires, right? Um, the thing in in a lot of like online discourse, I see this a lot on Reddit, um, uh, where people, a lot of folks don't like the concept of misfire, and and rightfully so, right? It's it's a bit of an awkward mechanic because it penalizes a fighter. the The idea is that firearms have a differenting misfire value, right? Like a a, a low powder low charge weapon um like a, a coat pistol might have a misfire score of one right where if you roll a one on the d20 your weapon misfires it can't be used until you repair it right um uh but then you know a blunderbuss or you know a more crude weapon might have a, a higher misfire score like three or even a four um and so if you're a fighter and you've got extra attack right you're making more attacks which means that you have a higher chance per round you know the more attacks that you're making in order to fulfill your fighterly duties, um, the more the greater the opportunity of you misfiring. And if you're only carrying a single weapon on you, right, and that weapon misfires, well, then you're out of the fight until you get it fixed. And it's it it, it is a negative feedback loop. Um, and so, I I I will say this to my dying breath, right? I think uh, the problem with misfire mechanics, um, uh, is the 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 issues that players sometimes have with misfire is not a mechanical one it's an issue of itemization right because that is just, it's baked into the weapons that you're using and so you can't have a simulation of black powder warfare that doesn't have you know your, your gun jamming uh the powder charge getting damp right it failing to go off uh something happening catastrophically that causes it to you know detonate in your hand like this all these things happened mm -hmm. but if you know through usage of, of our war gear system, right, we give you slots where you can bring multiple loaded flintlocks into the battlefield, right? We give you, uh, we you know definitely encourage you to carry a sidearm, but you know if that is bringing as many guns on your person as you can, or a melee weapon as a backup, um, or you know as uh, maybe we can get into later, right? Um, if you want to instead specialize in an advanced weapon like a revolver, which we now have rules for. Um, you can uh, you can do so. It's just going to take up you know some more of your war gear, some more of your your uh, kind of loadout to specialize in you know that kind of early finicky you know eighteen thirty seven uh, you know Sam Colt style revolver that still didn't it was it was revolutionary for its time pun uh, absolutely intended um, but uh, didn't quite have all the kinks worked out from it yet. I believe I believe in the engineering world they call these teething troubles. Mm -hmm. And for me, per for me personally, I've I do under I do understand the vi I do understand the vitriol, but I th I've al I've always felt that the big the one of the big problems is the fact that a lot of a lot of weapons that have mi that have misfire, a lot of features that are doing that are doing that, aren't doing a whole lot to uh, to offset it. I.e., the reward isn't making the risk worth it. Right. Yeah, that's a really good point as well. And where where I contrast this with um, nations and cannons is the amount of is the amount of damp the amount of damage. And in particular, the amount of piercing damage that can that can be done with firearms. Yeah, we and we definitely balance them. You know, like I said, um, a musket is is a that's a seventy caliber musket ball that that thing's hurling at you, right? Um, 
we we got went through quite a few design cycles, but we we centered on um, the the footman, uh, sort of a CR one fourth representation of like a your your standard redcoat line soldier, and I think we gave them eleven HP in the final reckoning, um, and and that number is if you roll average on a brown best musket and you've got like a plus three to your dex, right? You are going to kill a footman in a single shot. That is that, and that was a hundred percent intentional, right? Like uh, if this thing hits you, it's gonna hurt. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, uh, that's why we give, um, in addition to like giving other tools to like um, allow a- other items and, and uh, gambits and things like that, that engage with misfires to give players more flexibility, more options. Um, we also give them a couple more like defensive options um, because you know a couple unlucky hits um, and your player's going down, right? Um, so cover becomes a lot more important. Um, you know, uh, uh, striking from ambush, of course, is extremely important, right? Um, and uh, one of the one of the new updates that we've made in this iteration, um, we've added a new damage type, um, which we're calling ballistic damage. Um, and so that is dealt um, when uh, you're under fire by a piece of artillery um, or by a volley fire, right? So if a, if a group of, of footmen enemies are, are lined up together, a sergeant or, you know, another officer can order them to execute a volley fire. Um, you know, so they all, they all fire in mass and, uh, in, you know, in, in a line. And um, anyone caught in that line is going to make a deck save um, or, or take a bunch of ballistic damage. And uh, this is intentional <laughs> because uh, previously barbarians, um, you know, in a lot of the places we had, uh, were just tanking um, piercing damage, you know, while raging, which like they absolutely should be able to. Like there is that. There are a lot of you know sort of colorful anecdotes of like these like grenadiers or big tall soldiers, right? Um, uh, who could maybe not shrug off a shot, but definitely keep going with a couple of a couple of hits in them, right? Um, but we we definitely wanted if that group of red coats lines up and they all level their muskets at you, even if you're a raging barbarian, we want you to to want to duck for cover at that moment. Yeah. Um. Because even. There's a difference between bullet resistant and bullet, and, or I actually I, w- I was gonna say the difference between bullet resistant and bullet proof. A better th- a better thing is that um people have people have had people wearing Kevlar have gotten broken ribs from getting shot. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but when you met, when you mentioned the the whole thing the whole thing of a of a firing line like that. Um, all that I could think of was if you fire enough bullets, you'll eventually hit something. <laughs> that, that was the, the tactic of the day. <laughs> and, and, and honestly, like I was saying before, right, that was the tactic of the day from, you know, um, the mid, if not early uh, 17th century, like, you know, the end of the Pike and Shot era, mm-hmm. really th- up through the Civil War, right? It took a couple of years before... Um, you know, uh, the, the the various commanders, you know, both on the Confederate and the Union side, to realize like, oh, you know, uh, just throwing our boys into a meat grinder um, is isn't working. Uh, we have we have to maybe use use Viking tactics and sharpshooting, and you know, um, uh, for for which, which is all stuff that that happened at a small scale with sort of guerrilla or, or what's called in the eighteenth century. Uh, um, I'm gonna butcher the French, but the the, the petite guerre. Um, uh but um don't worry it's yeah. f- don't worry it's the french it's the french right yeah <laughs> um but you know for, for until that became uh kind of hard won battlefield wisdom you know at the organizational level uh to to really change the way that troops were deployed and mass it you know it really wasn't until you know almost the the end of the civil war um yeah mhm uh Although there is there, I may I may end up I may end up house ruling it, but there is there is one, um, ty- there is one type of firearm that I'm that I may put in, just to just for, just for the just for the sake of the lulls, uh-huh. for, for a future nations and canon campaign, and that is, a that is some variant of a um punt gun. 
<laughs> we, we get questions about this a bunch of times. <laughs> it was it's never used in the battlefield. Never, never at all used in the battlefield. But you, you want to explain what a punt gun is, or should I? Um, you can fill in the blanks, but I'll give I'll give the skinny. The punt gun was a was a was a gun that was specifically designed for hunting large amounts of duck. It the problem was it did its job too well to the point that it was banned. And, and directly led to the depopulation of several waterfowl species in the Northeast. Uh, now they're, they're 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 you know giant, basically giant shotguns with barrels that are like I don't know up to like ten feet long in some instances, right? Because yeah. uh, you know you could theoretically fire at standing, but most of them were like uh, used in shallow draft boats. Yes. You would have folks you know just paddling out quietly lying down, you know, uh, prone with this giant, you know, cannon sticking out the side you know, uh, or the front of, uh, you know, like a raft or a kayak, right? Just sneaking up on those poor, poor unsuspecting mallards and blasting like 30 of them away in one shot. And, well, there, there is that, it, there is that infamous image of, of, um, of somebody, somebody holding it standing while, so, while well, someone else has the thing on their shoulder, mm -hmm. but yeah, that that recoil is going to lead to uh, uh, not not a good time for uh, the poor unfortunate I'd soul like in to front. I'd like to say that we've that we've since learned when it comes to firearm engineering, but um, the Fat Mac exists. <laughs> <laughs> Which have you ever have you ever seen the have you ever seen the Fat Mac? Is that the uh, the one in in Fallout the the sort of miniature? No, not. Uh... No, no. That that's that's, that's a, a fat man. Yeah, that's a fat that's a fat man. That's a whole different story. The Fat Mac is a it is it is technically considered a hunting rifle, chambered in nine fifty JDJ, which is fucking huge. <laughs> To the, it is obviously it is obviously single shot. Though you have to, you have to take the bolt. You have to take the bolt out to reload the thing. <laughs> um, yeah, that's that's uh, you know hand carried artillery at that point, right? That 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 ceases to be a fire, a small arm, and that that becomes a large arm. <laughs> Like I said, it's technically considered, a, a, according to the ATF, it's technically considered a hunting rifle. <laughs> what the hell you'd be hunting with? What the hell you'd be hunting for for something like that? I don't know. Um, poss possibly, po possibly, bo possibly a bo possibly a big ass boar. That's the only thing I could see someone hunt hunting with. And f for the record, I sh I shared with you an image of what it looks like. <laughs> Trying, trying to fire the thing. And just look at how huge that thing is. Oh god, that's like a. It's like as 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 wide around as like Arnold Schwarzenegger's arm. Oh my god. Yeah, and for the sake of comparison, I'll sh I will share one other image with you that is <laughs> comparative. That is a comparative look. You have a twenty-two long rifle, a two-two-three Remington. A thirty out six Springfield, and then the nine fifty JDJ. Uh, truly a, a, a titan among men. Yeah. Um, I think this is, this is a good segue for me to talk about the uh, the elephant gun. Yeah, <laughs> the elephant gun in the room. Uh, yeah. So this is this. You know, we, we uh, since we we created this um, this expansion of our, our our time system, you know, to to handle later uh, eras. You know, we, we also have um, created a couple of things that have earlier weapon uh, systems. Um, you know, we go over matchlock weapons uh, in, in detail and give you some some uh, primers on um, things like yeah. earlier uh, bayonets um, so you could, you know, play a more uh, technologically primitive game set in, you know, uh, the, the earlier uh, era of 1650 or so. Um, elephant guns, you know, we... We we talk about things like revolvers and breech loading weapons and you know lever action kind of prototype pre Winchester volitional guns, um, but my favorite is always the elephant gun. Um, 
which is it you know it very similar uh it it it's just a big fuck off gun with uh you know a a, a two bore um c- cartridge you know it that's i think like a solid inch in diameter hmm. right um uh, uh which which is just intended to stop a charging bull elephant um you know uh in in uh, the the savannah this was used sort of um you know the british took over uh the dutch colony of south africa um i forget the exact timetable but it was sometime during the napoleonic wars where it like officially became a british um uh protectorate because the dutch lost their ability to you know field uh a- any sort of presence overseas um and you know, more and more you had the sort of phenomenon of British nobles and aristocrats and, you know, ultimately Teddy Roosevelt, (laughs) right, going out to the bush in in Africa uh, to hunt big game. Um, And, you know, elephants, of course, being uh, one of the prized targets. Um, So we have, number one, uh, the elephant gun deals ballistic damage, like I was just talking about mm-hmm. before, right? It does not deal PLC. Again, it, it, it is a small hand cannon. Um, uh, and it has a property uh, called stopping power. Um, and the way stopping power works is um, it has a, a, a score value listed, um, which, which equals your strength, right? Um, so similar to certain heavy armors, you can't use this, you can't fire this weapon. Um, or if you, you do fire it at its disadvantage, I think. Um, unless you have the listed strength score, which is, is interesting, right? It's like, um, okay, I'm typically strength is not utilized a whole lot with making ranged attacks. So what, what type of character is going to want to be carrying this? Um, you know, uh, it, it's an advanced weapon, so it has like some accuracy bonuses. So basically, even if you don't have a very high dex because you've pumped a lot into the strength, um, you know, that's kind of intended in like you know th- this is what the barbarian carries right this 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 is what your 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 muscle uh muscle bound uh you know uh warrior is, is going to be toting deep into uh in his safari um and when you hit an enemy with stopping power you could effectively um give up uh if you have extra attack you could give up any of your additional attacks uh that you have beyond the first um to stun the target that you that you hit, they have to make a Constitution save, um, and they're stunned for that many turns. Um, so you know the idea being uh, number one um, uh, that you know uh, an elephant or um, uh, a cape buffalo, right, or any of these you know, hippopotamus and these these dangerous animals, um, you might want to consider modeling them in your game uh, as having like resistance to bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing. You know because they they have very tough hides. Maybe. Uh, um, you know, like uh, saltwater crocodiles, right? Like they're they're like these these large, imposing animals. Um, typically, can take quite a few uh, shots, even like direct musket balls. Um, uh, in in the pre modern era, uh, before they go down. Um, and so, of course, this does ballistic damage, so uh, it bypasses that. Um, and it it has the capability to, if you have managed to piss off a bull elephant. Um, to at least give your party a turn to uh, reposition and figure out what to do, if not run, uh, run for your lives, because you you were sorely uh, underprepared for this encounter. Mm-hmm. And to be f- as I if I was, as I've always understood, you need that le- you would need that level of powder because um, even if, even if the sh- even if the shot if you're trying to sh- if you're trying to stop a um, a charging elephant or rhino or boar. Yeah, the bullet might kill them, but they're still moving. There's, there, there's. They still <laughs> you you got to knock momentum. it back. <laughs> they still have, mo- they still have momentum. So, a lesser one might, a lesser one might kill it, but it's still gonna be sliding you, and you still may get hit. Uh, which I'm, I haven't found it yet, but I'm pretty sure that's been the subject of a Darwin Award at least once. <laughs> um, yeah, that wouldn't surprise me. I know there was one about some guy in a- some idiot in Africa who um, adopted a baby hippo and decided and decided to raise it, even though everybody, including his wife, was telling him don't do it. Then he ends up getting. Then the thing gets gets bigger and kills him. Mm-hmm. 
Everybody talks about being killed by lions. Nobody ever talks about getting killed by hippos. I think it's something like a hundred people, you know, along yeah. the Nile are killed each year. By yeah, hippos. they they are they are, and and they're herbivores, right? They they just have a fierce territorial instinct. Yeah, yeah, you don't mess with those guys. Um. Now, when it came, now, when it comes to when it comes to when it comes to character choices, um, what I what I couldn't help but notice for Flintlocks and Fulminates is that you have you have added a bit more when it came to feats and ga and gambits. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm gu I'm guessing this is where that chicken and egg thing comes in. Yeah, it's. Uh, I I think that the best example actually is uh, is fighting styles, right? Because in our in our previous um, you know iteration of our core rules. Uh, we we very intentionally made it so that archery, you know, the sort of archery is the standard fighting style for ranged combat. It gives a plus two to attacks made with ranged weapons, right? Um, because all ranged weapons are bows or crossbows, um, or I, I guess like blow darts um, in in five A, right? Yeah, that are not who, thrown. Who the hell uses blow darts? Yeah, yeah, like they're not. Yeah, they're not. They're not good, right? Um, but uh, you know, the style is called archery. Right. Well, I think it's also kind of interesting if like that level of precision applies to uh, bows and arrows um, because they they were still a weapon that were utilized you know on the frontier. Um, they definitely have some advantages, uh, be the ability to fire silently uh, without giving away your position, right? Mm -hmm. um, over um, uh, a rifle or a musket. So we definitely wanted to to give that um, a little bit of push and pull. Mm -hmm. So we we left that fighting style. We altered it, you know, in playing in a nation's cannons game. So that it applies to uh, long bows and short bows only, um, but we didn't add any new fighting styles. We did a couple things like, um, you know, uh, the the protection fighting style. Um, uh, we wanted it so, so that you could use it with a long sword. Now, um, uh, so you know, uh, if you're standing next to a buddy, right, um, you can help them out by effectively by by, by fencing, right. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, because because people are not going to be carrying shields on the battlefield unless you're maybe you know uh, doing a Highland charge or something like that, right? Um, uh, because they we we've, we've modeled them specifically; so they do not provide any protection against attacks made by firearms. Um, uh, but you know, uh, we were asked for specific fighting styles that worked better with our weapons, um, and so our weapons fall into four broad categories. Um, uh, pistol, rifle, musket, and um, carbine, mm -hmm. and um, so we created two new fighting styles for this. And this is an attempt to like bring new character options, so that just from the get go, you're creating your character, kind of you're, you're picking and choosing. You can't use all weapons as effectively, right? That's that's what kind of makes having a balanced party is a party that use that has specialized in, in some way in in a couple of different uh, you know uh, different types of shooters. So. One is called Quick Flint, um, and that allows you to make a ranged attack with a pistol or a carbine while an enemy is within five feet of you. Normally, that gives you disadvantage on a ranged attack. So you know you can kind of you can take a snapshot against somebody who would be otherwise kind of threatening you, um, uh, which I think you know, works for the sort of small like a light like a pistol or like a sort of a you know a sawn off uh, a carbine things like that. The other one that we've created is um, a long arms fighting style. And this applies to rifles and muskets. And um, you know, uh, with if if you were playing a pistol build, um, uh, a miss or a misfire isn't super catastrophic for you because you probably have a whole bunch of pistols kind of on your person at any given time, right? Mm -hmm. um, but a rifle or a musket, uh, if you're specializing in those weapons, it's it's trickier, right? You can't really carry too, so many of them. You can have you know, one in your hands and one slung over your shoulder and maybe a sidearm or two. But the ability to carry multiple rifles into the field is, is, is tougher. Mm -hmm. um, and so this one is, like, it, there has been a lot of, a lot of, a big kind of feedback that we got um, was that if you miss with a rifle or a musket and it kind of you, 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 you kind of whiff, you whiff big and then your turn feels like, oh, you know, like I didn't really accomplish a whole lot. So the the long arms funding style is um, uh, when you make an attack, uh, I believe it's, it's you spend a reaction uh, to trigger this ability. Um, and then, um, you know, even if you miss, 
um, you can still like cause your shot to graze your enemy, um, which deals one d four points of force damage. Mm-hmm. Um, and that you know that that can be enough, right? If if a footman has taken a shot before, right, that can be enough to be the finishing blow, right? And that was that's that's kind of our what we, what we wanted it to still feel like. If you are uh, you know have this sort of uh, heroic fantasy of being the sharpshooter, right? And you're you're up in a tree, kind of concealed in there, and you level your rifle and you miss. Well, you know, even then, being able to do a meaningful amount of damage, even on a miss, you know, in this kind of limited way, um, feels like it 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 still furthers that um, that that character's archetype, it makes them still feel heroic and part of the encounter. Mm-hmm. Now, with the, now within within all of that, I may have asked this beforehand, but do you do you guys have have any plans down the road to? Um, explore, explore the sandbox that you've created with mass combat. We're, yeah, I think we actually chatted about this a little bit last time. It's definitely something that we're interested in. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll take mass combat and naval combat, and I'll put them in the we want to do them, but we know that they're going to require a significant amount of, of prototyping and playtesting, um, and we want to do them right. You know, So certainly not, it's, it's not on our, we have, we have some vague ideas that we're totally not ready to put public yet um but uh i think you know especially mass combat would be something where we do uh we get into a napoleonic campaign um that would absolutely be you know critical for being able to uh kind of render those large battles you know at the game table Mm -hmm. um and and you know kind of find the sweet spot between players being involved but players not being completely in the driver's seat Mm -hmm. you know um, there's 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 some negotiation to be had there, yeah, uh, which which would be interesting. Um, but it, you know, as as far as as general like content, right? We wanted to put uh, Flintlocks and Fulminates out now mm-hmm. because uh, it allows you to play use our core rules in a bunch of different time frames and 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 play you know play the the game that you are interested in. Um, and and the next step that we have, um, which uh, I'll, I'll I'll just do a quick plug, right? Um, we have the pre-launch page up for our Kickstarter now. It's 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 actually our first Kickstarter because um, we wanted to make sure we had everything. We we nailed everything down here. We kicked the tires, and this is a good product before we started asking anybody uh, to pitch in. Um, but our first Kickstarter uh, is, is is called the American Crisis. Uh, it's going to cover the first half of the American Revolution, six adventure modules, two new subclasses, a bunch of new gambits, historical information, uh, annotated uh, atlas about North America and you know the cities of New York, Boston, Philadelphia, Quebec. Um, all of that wrapped up in a color hardcover, um, probably about 250 page book. Um, and that is gonna be going live um, sometime in uh knock on wood here uh we're thinking late october um but uh for now if you go to that site um and i'll, I'll give you the link uh so you can just drop it in the the description when you uh post this um uh, if folks want to check it out and follow along um that would be that'd be awesome but yeah it's it's our our general our hope is to um kind of a two-pronged uh publishing strategy right where on the one hand we continue to push the envelope of like what 5e and 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 combat in 5e can do add new subclasses and things like this um and new mechanical supplements while also um creating these sort of um source book uh campaign guides so that uh, a gm can you know do a deep dive into a particular conflict and you know uh leading with the american revolution but leaving the door open for you know uh certainly in the napoleonic wars um uh, things like uh, the early republic. Um, uh, we we get asked a lot um, about you know kind of uh, 1812 or weird one-offs like the Barbary Wars um, and uh, you know um, Lewis and Clark. Um, I, I personally think that um, you know something that that might be really cool would be like the adventures of Harriet Tubman, like right on the eve of the Civil War, you know, um, uh, kind of uh, going around um, with a lot of the, the intrigue and the sort of the, the powder keg that was um, the nation at the time um, and and delving into the secrets of the Underground Railroad um, could be a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. So there's a lot, a lot of fertile ground there. And then, of course, everyone wants pirates. And at some point, we will absolutely do a pirate uh, source book with the full naval combat rules. You know, we just want to make sure that we have time to do it right. Yeah. If you do that, I hope you release it on internet on international talk like a pirate day. Oh, oh yeah. Because uh, does Facebook still do that thing where like you can change your your uh, language to be the pirate language, and then everything is ours and mateys? I don't think so. Which oh, is unfortunate. God. That was like the one thing that they ever did, which was good. No, I, I, no, because fa- Facebook is too busy losing money on that metaverse shit. <laughs> uh, pointed, no comment. <laughs> oh, look, I'm not here. I'm not here to hit a man while he's down. I'm here to kick him because that's easier. <laughs> but, uh, one to, But I do want to. I do want to give my sincere thanks for taking the time out of your schedule to come back to my temple and enjoy the madness at play here. Absolutely. Yeah, this is it's, it's always fun to uh, have a chance to dive into kind of like the design rationale and unpack some of these things. And I hope this has been you know valuable to your listeners. Mm-hmm. Um, before I bail, I actually... So there, Flintlocks and Fulminates is... It's available as a uh, standalone uh, PDF um, for uh, four ninety nine dollars on drive through RPG. Um, but it also comes bundled with um, our Misfire deck, um, which is uh, the other sort of half of that product, um, which is a, a critical fumbles deck um, that is split into small arms, artillery, and grenades, and uh, gives you the opportunity to... Uh, well, make misfires more interesting and also explosive. So mm. I've got them split into those categories. Uh, pick one, and I will draw the card for you, and I will tell you what happens when you misfired. <laughs> uh. yep. And th- and that it- and those can th- I always like fumble tables, and this is just another evolution of that. Yeah, and it, we wanted to be, make it, you know, a card deck specifically, uh, so we can um, kind of put a lot of information there um, on them. Uh, you know, uh, the good thing about a card is that you can print it in pretty small font, so you can actually, you know, squeeze as much content on there and kind of hold it up to your to your face to actually uh, uh, read it. It's a lot more playable than having to, you know, flip through the AD and D book to the tables way, way, way in the back somewhere where you ever you you left your bookmark. But like, like I said, any, any <clears throat> anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>